Thank you. You may be seated. The marvelous grace of God, grace that is greater than all our sin. If you understand just how bad your sin is, then you begin to understand what grace is all about. Every one of us, wicked, vile, polluted, untouchable, as dirty and filthy as you can imagine, and the grace of God reached down into that muck and mire to rescue us. Today we'll be talking a little bit about grace and how God, having put up with these two old guys for so many years, finally gets them moving. Finally gets them moving. While you're turning there to that passage in Exodus chapter 7, let me just remind you once again, the acts and facts are out there on the table. We encourage you to pick that up. It's a, an excellent edition and a lot of very good articles in that. From Atheist to Creationist, you want to read that. Dinosaur fossils and late flood rocks and so on. Be sure to pick one of those up after the service today. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn over there to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 7. You recall that immediately preceding our text today, we've seen a, a number of very interesting genealogical records tracking the 12 tribes and the groups that God is going to bring out, these 12 different tribes, out of the land of Egypt and bring them into the promised land according to a promise he gave to Abraham, restated it to Isaac, restated it to Jacob, restated it to the 12 tribes, even though they had gone down into Egypt, they've been down in Egypt for 400 years, and now God is about to work on their behalf and bring them out. The old men finally obey. Now I need to tie some things together from last week. Now I asked a question last week and um, some of you actually came up to me afterwards and said you didn't answer that question last week that you asked us. You're right. Why don't you think about it for a week? And I hope you have thought about it. How many of you even remember I asked a question? Just just that I asked a question. Did, okay, a few of you remember that I did ask a question. Okay, how many of you can remember what the question was that I asked? <laughs> well, we got two people who remember what the question was. Three people who remember what four people. Okay, that's good. What the question was that I asked last week? A rather significant and important question, because it is the type of question. If you learn how to answer this type of question, you'll be able to answer most of the questions that unbelievers and um, infantile theologians try to ask who don't understand certain things uh, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later as we get farther into the message last week I covered several things that I had deliberately skipped over when we were studying genealogies in this context we noticed that only a few men in the genealogy have additional comments made about them in the text which should set them apart and make them significant the first one that we looked at was Simeon the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanitish woman. These are the families of Simeon. And we pointed out that that was a rebuke and a reminder of Simeon's hypocrisy. And also it was a reminder to us that what you do is recorded in God's books. There are consequences for what we do. I'm stepping out of the preaching role and getting into an admonishing role at this point. There are consequences for what we do. There are consequences for choices that we make. Everything you have ever said, everything you have ever done, everything that you have ever thought, every attitude and every motive is written in God's books. Very important that you trust Christ for salvation because it's all there. And only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse you from all sin. I feel compelled to say that this morning because there may be somebody listening to this that doesn't really know Christ. They are a fake Christian. They are a Christian on the outside, but they are not really a Christian on the inside. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know Jesus? Not do you know about him. Do you know Jesus? 
Oh, that the Spirit of God might work in your heart and draw you to Him. There is nothing that you have ever done that you will get away with in eternity. It's recorded. Our sins are forgiven if we trust Christ. But certain actions, and we'll see this in just a moment because I'm going to expand on Simeon and his brothers. There are consequences to our actions. The things that we choose to do and the things that we choose to refrain from doing have consequences to them. You recall that when we were talking about Simeon, we read the story of Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, by his wife Leah. It emphasizes that in Genesis chapter 34, who she really was. Do you remember anything at all about Leah? She was the substitute that Laban tricked Jacob into marrying. They'd been having a big wedding feast. Jacob was probably as drunk as a skunk. He went in thinking that he was going in to Rachel, who's the one he had contracted for, and he woke up in the morning and found out it was Leah. She was his wife, whether he liked it or not. She was his wife. You know how he worked seven more years to get Rachel. And then he picked up a couple more wives, too, along the way. Bilhah and Zilpah, the handmaids of each of those two young women. Do you remember something else about Leah, though? Leah bore Jacob six sons. In addition to Dinah, she bore Jacob six sons. She had at least seven children. We don't know about any other daughters, but she had at least those seven. Do you remember who the sons of Leah are? By the way, six sons, that's half the tribes of Israel. Half the tribes of Israel come from Leah. Each of the other three had two, two sons, but Leah had six. God was saying something there, too. But do you remember who those six were? There was Reuben. And then there was Simeon. And then there was Levi. And then there was Judah. And then there was Issachar. And then there was Zebulun. In other words, that makes Dinah, who we studied last week in Genesis 34, that makes her the full sister of Simeon and Levi, the two brothers that went on that murderous rampage. She was their full sister, not a half-sister. She was half-sister to all the rest of them, but she was full sister to those two. I want to mention one other side note on the dysfunctional family life of Jacob. Jacob's very firstborn son was Reuben. Of all the wives, Reuben was number one. He should have received the patriarchal blessing. He gave it up because he committed immorality. He lost the patriarchal blessing because he committed incest with Jacob's slave wife, his concubine. She's called a concubine, even though she's a wife. She's called a concubine, Bilhah. Did you know that Jacob even mentions that event in his prophetic blessing over his sons as he lies dying at age 147? He mentions the incest that occurred approximately 106 years previously, according to Unger's chronology. It's a long time to remember something. It had occurred 106 years previously. Simeon and Levi, who were the next two sons in line, who should have received the patriarchal blessing, both of them also were passed over because of what happened in Genesis 34 where we see the story of Dinah. One little girl 
doing evil brought a curse on a lot of people. Those are the two, as you read in the text, who murdered Shechem, who mort murdered his son Hamor, who had had the affair with Dinah, and who murdered all the men in that city. That's the reason that Simeon's hypocrisy is po pointed out here. His sons are listed for us, and he had a bunch. We have five that, five that look at least legitimate, but then it says Shaul, the son of a Canaanitish woman. He has six sons, just like his mother did. But his last son is the son of a Canaanitish woman. You see, Simeon's hypocrisy, which is pointed out in that genealogy there, was that he objected to his full sister marrying a Hivite, or a Canaanite in general terms. But after he and Levi murdered all the men of the city, he grabbed all the women and kids and apparently fathered at least one son by one of those women. Then all the brothers apparently split the women and children between themselves as war booty. It says so in the text. Verse 27 and following, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all who was in the house. There are consequences to sin, folks. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you can get away with it. If you're not saved, hell is what you're looking forward to. But if you are saved, your sins are forgiven. But there are temporal and extended consequences to your sins. Three guys got passed over on the issue of immorality. Reuben on the issue of incest. Simeon and Levi on the issue of murder and also taking pagan wives. Now there's a bright side to it, as God always gives us a bright side. When he warns us, and the warnings are serious, don't ignore the warnings. The bright side is a reminder to us that God is a God of grace. We just sang about that. That's the hymn that we had right before the message. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. Grace that exceeds our sin and the guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. It's a reminder that God is a God of grace. When you look at these guys, God uses weak, sinful, wicked people to accomplish his will. God still keeps his promises to us in spite of our grotesque failures. That does not give us a license to sin. We're about to partake of the Lord's table. Make sure your sin is dealt with. People at Corinth died because they didn't deal with their sin before they came to the Lord's table. God doesn't give us a license to sin, but he does give us a reminder of what the grace of God, according to his gracious elective purposes, is all about. God had made promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to the twelve tribes. He kept the promises. But certain people got passed over for blessing because of violating God's standards. The second person that we looked at last week, you recall, and all that extra stuff was free just now. We looked at Amram, the father of Moses and Aaron. Amram took him Yochevet, Jochebed, his father's sister to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 130 and seven years. In other words, Amram had married his blood aunt, which means that she was not only Moses' mother, but she was also his great aunt. And we talked about the differences of between marriage under the law and before the law and post-law during this age of grace. We saw that there were many different things that we would not be able to do today. For example, we saw that Cain married one of his sisters, 
married one of the other sons and daughters of Adam. It's stated so in Genesis 5:4. Abraham married his half sister uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. And third, the next two people mentioned with comments in the text were reminders that mothers have an incredible impact on the character development of their children. The first mother who is mentioned in that list had two that turned out good and two that turned out bad. Aaron took Elisheba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nahashon, to wife, and she bare him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And of course, Nadab and Abihu were killed by God, and we'll not go over that story again. And then Eleazar uh, became the high priest next and served in the tabernacle with Ithamar, his brother. In that second case, we find that Eliezer, his wife, is mentioned. Eliezer, Aaron's son, took him one of the daughters of Putiel to wife, and she bare him Phineas. We saw that that was a godly woman. We find out how she raised Eliezer. We saw five things about him. Number one, his zeal turned aside the wrath of God from the moral compromise of Baal Peor. When Balaam had encouraged Balak, king of Moab, to send the Moabitish girls into the camp of the Israelites to commit fornication. It tells us that he was zealous for the Lord and he speared two of them to death as they were committing immorality. One who was a princess and one who was a prince from Israel. He killed them both. And God said that turned aside his wrath. We saw that he was the man who led the priests blowing the trumpets into battle. We saw that he led the delegation to see if the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had fallen into apostasy, and that he's the one who turned aside the, rest of the, ra ra the wrath of the rest of the nation of Israel against their brethren. We saw that he was the one who provided the burial place for his father Eliezer, the high priest, the son of Aaron. We saw that he was the one who inquired of the Lord as high priest whether or not to attack the tribe of Benjamin for practicing sodomy, and God authorized him to lead Israel against the Benjamites. A mother makes a difference. How mothers train their children makes an incredible difference. And here's something, here's a personal Bible study you can do sometime. Always pay attention to the text when it tells you that so-and-so was the mother of somebody. That's also a great thing to do in your personal devotion someday and just go through the scriptures. You will find that a lot of the kings of Israel it mentions who their mothers were. Yeah, I know, nobody likes to read the genealogies of the kings of Israel. <laughs> but if you do, and you read that so-and-so was the mother of so-and-so, you will begin to discover why her son turned out the way he did. You'll learn some things about it. We looked at the term genealogy, found 15 times in the Old Testament, always related to national Israel. The term genealogy is plural, eight times in the entire Bible, six in the Old Testament, two times in the New Testament. And we saw that the reason for that is because all those Old Testament mentions and the other times that it's mentioned in the New Testament, which relate to Israel, do not relate to the church because the church is not Israel. And Paul tells us when he speaks of genealogies in the context of the church, he says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And he says, but avoid foolish questions in genealogies and contentions, strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Everybody wants to talk about their dead potato ancestors. The usefulness of genealogies is to show us how God deals with people who are under sin and how he redeems sinners. They also give us, as we cited last week, an article from Biblioteca Sacra, how the scriptural genealogies also pinpoint for us the young age of the earth and the young age that man has been on the earth. Now that brings us to today. So before we begin today, I want to pick up with that question that I asked you last week to ponder. So here we are, guys, back with that question that young theologians have debated literally for centuries. When we look at Jesus and his genealogy, was Jesus able not to sin, or was Jesus not able to sin? If you think about it, there is a very striking difference between those two. Was Jesus able not to sin, or was Jesus not able to sin? 
That question has been argued since the Roman Catholic scholasticism of the Middle Ages. To answer the question, let me ask you another question. This is so that you get into the right mindset and thinking as to how to answer this kind of questions because pagans will ask you lots of questions like this and they think they've got you stumped. So let's learn some ways to answer those questions. It will help us. Here's another question. You have to answer it yes or no. Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Yes or no? <laughs> I'm getting a few responses down here. How about this one? Suppose I asked one of these uh, teenage girls back here, <clears throat> have you stopped beating your wife yet? Now you know there's something wrong with the question, right? But you know how to how to peel it apart. Or you ask a guy, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You see, the question assumes some things. It assumes, number one, that he's married. It assumes, number two, that he does, in fact, beat his wife. This is the kind of question you can't really answer yes or no because it begins with false assumptions. The answer is that the question is based on a concealed error. Just like that first question that I gave you, the theological one. It makes certain false assumptions about the nature, the character, and the attributes of God. Just keep those things in mind. When you get this kind of a question, say, are there any assumptions in this question about the nature, the character, or the attributes of God? Do you remember those things, three things? What are they? Nature. Okay, a little different order there, but yeah, the three things. Everybody, I think I got them. The nature, the character, the attributes of God. When you hear one of these weird questions, just remember those three issues. Because that's the way we answer that silly question about, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Except we're not dealing with God in that case. We're dealing with a person. But it has some false assumptions in it. When you're dealing with a question the pagan tries to hit you with, ask yourself the question, I know there's something wrong with this question. It's going to be something that deals with the nature, the character, or the attributes of God. That's where my problem is in this question. So how can I work it out? How can I break that question apart so that I can answer the question? So let's look at that question for a minute. Let's look at the question, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Let's break that apart. The first phrase, can God make a rock? Yes. That assumes the infinite creative power of God over simple matter. We all as Christians believe that, don't we? The infinite power of God, the creative power of God over simple matter. The next two words, so big, has a very interesting assumption. The word big assumes a finite size no matter how large. So big. Okay, so let's talk about finite size. I suppose it's as big as the entire universe. Still has finite size. The universe is not infinite. Only God is infinite so big. And then that last phrase, that he can't lift it. What does that assume? That assumes the possibility of a limit to omnipotence. That assumes the possibility of a limit to omnipotence. We're not talking probability here. We're talking, you know, we're talking, is there even the tiniest possibility of a limit to omnipotence? When you get a question like that, the question in itself contains certain self-contradictory elements and is therefore, if you've 
I think some of you have probably studied logic. I took some very interesting courses in logic in college from a br brilliant man, a brilliant logician. But that is, in the strictest logical sense, nonsense. So the first logical contradiction is concerning the divine attribute of omnipotence. There's a logical contradiction there. The second attack of false assumptions in that question is against the nature and the character of God. So the first thing was a divine attribute. That's where the first error was, related to divine attribute. The second error relates to the nature and the character of God. Because it assumes that there is the possibility that God could or would do something contrary to his nature and his character. In other words, it assumes that the all-wise God would even consider doing something foolish. There's no purpose in that. It's foolishness. It is not the character or the nature of God to do things that are either foolish or self-contradictory to his nature. So now let's apply those principles to that question that we asked a moment ago. Was Jesus able not to sin or not able to sin? Those two questions deal with different attributes of the nature of God, different aspects of his character. The first half of the question relates to the humanity of Christ. Was he able not to sin? Here we have an attempt to pit the humanity of Christ against the deity of Christ. But these two natures combined in one person are never in conflict. Able not to sin relates to his humanity and intrinsically implies a choice that in this case would be made by a sinless man, the one who's called the second Adam. Remember, the first Adam was innocent, but he was only human. He was not both God and man, he was only human. The second phrase, not able to sin, relates to the deity of Christ. Jesus is both God and man. God cannot sin, because whatever he does, it doesn't matter what he does, whatever he does is by its very definition righteous. I want you to understand that. That's very important. Whatever he does, since he's the one who defines what is righteous, whatever he does is by definition righteous. God writes the definitions whether we like it or not. He is not subject to any external standard. He is not subject to the standards of men and angels because he himself is the standard. Thus, the second half of the question is also technically logical nonsense. Jesus is not two persons. He is one person with two distinct natures. Both of those natures are inseparably welded together. It's called theologically the hypostatic union. But they are inseparably welded together for all of eternity ever since the Incarnation. He is one person with two natures. You and I are not. No one else has ever been. Jesus is one person with two distinct natures, fully human, fully God. But they are inseparably welded together. So the answer really is yes to both halves of the question. For the first half, was Jesus able not to sin? It's clear that Jesus had a choice and that he chose not to sin. That's the whole point of Matthew chapter 4, where the devil presents him with the three different temptations related to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Remember we talked about temptation last week. Temptation is not falling into sin. Temptation is the attack. But we are so used to falling into sin when we are attacked by temptation that we automatically assume a fall into sin. Jesus was tempted in all points, not in some points, in all points like as we are. Have you ever been tempted to lust? Jesus was tempted to lust. Were you ever tempted to covetousness? Jesus was tempted to covetous. Uh, were you ever tempted to steal? Jesus was tempted to steal. The devil threw the temptations at him. But Jesus is the God-man. 
And so the second half, he was not able to sin, relates to his deity. Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. For the second half, was Jesus not able to sin? The answer is yes, because God cannot sin. The bottom line is this. You cannot pit the humanity of Christ against the deity of Christ. Because he is one person, not two persons. He is genuinely human. He is genuinely divine. That kind of question is based on false assumptions and logical nonsense, contrary to what the Bible reveals about the person and the work of Christ. Okay, that brings us to our text for today for the next five minutes. That put me behind again. I was behind last week. I'm behind again, but we're going we're gonna to shoot at it anyway. Our text for today was, And the Egyptians... Starting in verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I stretch out mine hand upon Egypt, bring all the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron was fourscore and three years old, when they spake unto Pharaoh. The bottom line of this all is, it's better to obey late than never to obey. Do you know how much grief we've gone through to get to this point, as you looked at Moses and Aaron? As you looked at these two guys who are do I don't think we have anybody in here who's 80 years old or older. Nobody's 80 years old or older in here, right? I hope they're all watching us on the internet, but nobody here. Okay. But, yeah. Oh, there, there's one. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine not being in the center of God's will for 80 years and you finally get around to obeying him? Here we've got two guys. Here we've got two guys. How long does it take you to obey someone who's in authority over you? Look back over your life. When you were a child, can you think of any instances where you delayed obeying your parents? <laughs> well, everybody should be nodding yes to that one, okay? <laughs> yes, we did. Now a little harder. Can you think of any instance where your parents told you to obey and do something and because you dragged your feet for so long, they finally forgot about it, and you never did obey. Can you think of that? <laughs> I have somebody out here saying no, and then shaking their head and grinning, right. Okay, we all know that. If we thought hard enough, we could probably think of at least one time where our parents told us to obey, and we didn't. Let me ask you uh, another one. Was there any time that you were driving along and you saw a speed limit sign that said 25 miles an hour and you glanced past it and looked at your speedometer and saw you were going 35 and you kept on going at 35 or maybe even faster than that? Were there any times that you didn't obey? Was there any time that you ever had a boss who told you to do something and you didn't obey and then later you heard that you might be getting a pink slip so you decided you better obey and you did and didn't get your pink slip but maybe there were some times when you didn't obey and you got away with it do you know you never get away with it remember God keeps records but here he has two men who have dragged their feet and didn't obey. You remember all the arguments? We went through all the arguments that Moses made as to why he didn't have to do what God wanted him to do. We can make all the arguments, all the excuses in the world, but in the end, God, who is very patient, will see to it that we do what he tells us he wants us to do. So here we have it. Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron was fourscore and three years old when they spake unto Pharaoh. It's better to obey late than never. You know, as you look at obedience through the scriptures, there are some things that at least stand out to me. It is a topic that is a very large topic in the Bible. Let me just pick up a few out of the New Testament first, and then we'll give some illustrations out of the Old Testament. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Paul is talking about his call to ministry. Verses 1 through 4, he gives the gospel. In verse 5, he says, By whom, that is by Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship 
and it's for a specific purpose for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name do you know why God called you do you know why God saved you do you know why God gave you spiritual gifts it wasn't so that you could have fun it wasn't so that you could be lazy about it it wasn't so you could brag to somebody else that you've got this sort of gift and they've only got that kind of gift that was the problem at Corinth we're gonna be talking about Corinth in a few minutes when we come to the Lord's table that was a problem they had we received it for obedience to the faith among all nations that means no matter where you go there is not one nation on planet earth where you can go and say Whew, man I'm out of the jurisdiction now of that command for obedience among all nations for his name because you are a Christ bearing vessel obedience God had placed a special commission on Moses and Aaron they finally get around to obeying after all the arguments after all the scariness of wobbly knees and all the things that Moses had to go through including almost getting himself killed because he hadn't circumcised his son finally finally these two old guys are going to obey another verse from Romans chapter 6 verse 16 know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness you know perhaps the reason that you didn't obey your parents years and years ago was because there was some other kid in the neighborhood who egged you on and he was a rebel and you thought he's getting away with it let me see if I can get away with it did you know you were actually obeying that kid how about when it was just something rose up inside you and you just said I'm not gonna do it who are you obeying you're obeying the flesh Paul talks about that in great detail here in Romans chapter 6 everything we do is in obedience to something or someone either we are obeying the world the flesh the devil and the demons or else we are obeying God you see man is not made to make all his own free choices without any consequences we are in fact either slaves of Jesus Christ or we are slaves to the flesh and the world and the devil that's why Paul calls himself a doulos of Jesus Christ a doulos is a slave not merely a servant but a slave now you can have a loving master or you can have a cruel master and the Old Testament describes the difference between the two whereby an individual who for example had to got into slavery because he owed a debt and he couldn't pay it and so he became the property of the man to whom he owed the debt he could say at the end of seven years when he was supposed to be left free I love my master I will not go out and he would tell the master and the master would take him down to the doorpost of the tabernacle or then later to the temple and the priest would take an awl and bore a hole through his ear and put a signet in there showing this man's ear is open to the call of his master he has chosen his master because his master is kind his master loves him and he loves his master we have a loving master he never tells us to do what is bad for us he tells us only to do what is good and our ear is open to his call on our life have you responded to his love to you well there's so much more Paul commends the Romans in Romans 16 he says he, he appreciates them for your obedience has come abroad unto all men I am glad therefore on your behalf but yet I would have you to be wise in that which is good and simple concerning evil you know there are a lot of people who think well how can I fight pornography unless I look at a lot of it stupid he says be wise concerning that which is good be simple concerning that which is evil garbage in garbage out what you put in is what's going to come out you don't need to have all that other junk coming into your mind 
It's better to obey late than never. Are there things that you need to obey now that you've been resisting God for years? There are many other verses. We'll pick them up next week. Did you know that it involves your thought life too? 2 Corinthians 10.5 Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the what's our word? Obedience of Christ. You take all that stuff that's trying to build things in your mind and you throw it out. You bring every thought into the obedience of of Christ. You take it captive. That's what will change your life. That's what will finally get you moving the way that we see Moses and Aaron moving here. They were old guys. But it's better to obey late than never to obey. What is it that God has brought to your mind that needs to be right? As we've gone through this message specifically focused on that issue today because we're about to take the Lord's table and we need to come with clean hands and a pure heart that's why we have our preparatory service on Friday so that if God brings to our mind a brother or sister whom we have offended someone we've caused to stumble in their faith or something we need to make right with God something that's in our life that needs to be confessed and abandoned not just set on the shelf to pick up after communion that needs to be confessed and abandoned that's what repentance is all about you turn and go the other direction that's why we've talked about this today it's better to obey late than never the old men finally obey doesn't matter how old you are it applies to every one of us we need to make sure that when we come to the table set by our Lord himself memorializing what he did for us on Calvary's cross where he died for our sins was buried and rose again speaking to us of the body of Christ speaking to us of the blood of Christ the infinite sacrifice that he paid on Calvary's cross are you coming in obedience or are you coming with a rebellious spirit holding on to certain little pet sins that are hiding there in some little deep dark closet way 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 down in the dungeons of your own heart where you think nobody else will know about it but God knows about it folks we need to deal with it we need to deal with it before we take the Lord's table our gracious Heavenly Father how we thank you once again for the privilege of looking into your word it tells us many things that we often do not want to hear. It brings us to the point whereby we know that we have sinned. But how we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Father, as we will soon be taking the Lord's table together, we pray that you will help us to seriously consider what's going on in our own lives. And if there is sin there, to confess it to you, to repent of it, and then with joy and with fellowship with one another and with you, enter into the joy of the communion table. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In preparation for the Lord's table, let's take our hymnals and turn to number 413, Break Thou the Bread of Life, 413, and we'll sing the first and the fourth verses. Let's stand to sing. Break Thou the Bread of Life, dear Lord, to me. It's break the loaf by Calvary. Beyond the sacred page, I seek the Lord. My spirit pants for the living word. Oh, 
Jesus Christ, the Lord, to me, to me. As of its blessed sovereign, I go Excuse me, we have the Apostles' Creed. Let's join together. It's in your bulletin, starting at the bottom of the first page. We'll recite it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and he explains to them all the things that are needful not just sort of well it's nice if you take them or leave them but the things that are needful when we come to the Lord's table he explains how he got it by special revelation from Christ in other words this is not just Paul's ideas but he received it by divine revelation from Christ and here's what he said when you come together, therefore, unto one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before another his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What have you not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, this bread, and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Folks, there are some who choose not to eat and drink because they think, well, I don't want to examine myself. There are some who choose not to eat and drink because they say, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to risk it. The point of the Lord's table is it is not an option. It is a command to Christians. And because it is a command, it is a requirement for which God will hold us accountable if we do not do it. Have you resisted obedience, which is what we've just been talking about? Because you think you can get off easier that way? This is not a suggestion from Christ it's a command this do in remembrance of me or is it that you know you're not saved the Lord's table is only for those who are saved those are the only two possibilities either you're not saved or you are disobedient
you have to answer to God. Let a man examine himself. And so, having examined himself, having made sure things are right with God, having made sure that his sins are confessed, that he's repented of them, that he's turned from them, and so, let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, remember the two possibilities, either you're not saved, and you think there's a magic trick that's going to somehow get you into heaven, or you're saved and you're disobedient. He eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. That's what God does to Christians. The world is condemned, but we are chastened. God spanks those who are his own. The book of Hebrews tells us if you are without chastening, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. You're illegitimate. Because every child who really belongs to God, every one of his children, gets spanked at some time in their life. This is serious business here when we come to the Lord's table. Never take it lightly or for granted. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. That ye come not together unto condemnation. The bread here speaks of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul explains that in the text. The cup speaks of the blood of Christ. In his own body he bore our sins. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission. That means to send away. There is no sending away of sin. He bore our sins. He sent our sins away. The two things that you see portrayed very beautifully in the scapegoat and the Lord's goat in the Old Testament sacrifice. He did it for you. The Christian is supposed to keep short accounts with God. Have you kept short accounts? Are you ready to come to the Lord's table? Do you come with clean hands and a pure heart? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the bread. It reminds us that Jesus was truly human. He took upon him flesh and blood. He was born of the Virgin. He lived a perfect life. And then he was brought to Calvary. And as he was nailed to the cross and lifted between heaven and earth, he bore in his own body all of our sins. The sinless one, dying for those wicked sinners who were surrounding the cross and who radiated out from them and across the land of Judea and across the Middle East and across the world and all of their descendants and the ripples of that come down to us today sitting here in this room about to remember him he bore our sins Father, we thank you for this bread. Help us as we partake of it today, together today to remember Jesus. We do it in remembrance of him. Amen.
And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition was made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them, but they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified, and the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed, and Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming. Oh, we talked about this Friday night. Jesus making a prophecy about the great tribulation as he's on his way to Calvary. The days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren of the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And when he had given thanks, he took the bread and break it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Father, how we thank you also for the cup, the beautiful symbol of the blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanseth us from all sin, blood without which there is no remission of sin. The blood by which we have redemption, propitiation, reconciliation. The blood that is the ground of our imputation. The, the blood that is the foundation of our salvation. How we thank you, Father, for the precious blood of Jesus Christ your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, and Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. 
And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto thee, the day shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour. And there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that this is not only a memorial, but it is a message of expectancy. We remember what he did on Calvary. It's our whole reason for existence. He died for us. Without Jesus, we have no hope. Without his sacrificial death, there is no forgiveness for sins. Without our sins being borne by him and his blood being spilt on Calvary's cross, we have no redemption. Father, how we thank you that it also looks into the future. Because Jesus didn't stay dead, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he has promised that he will come again and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. And we know the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Gracious Father, oh, how I pray that if there is anyone here or listening who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, that today they would believe that today would be the day of their new birth. Father, help us to remember that we're looking forward to his return, not merely looking back but now looking for that promise, that blessed hope. For your word declares that every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Father, make us a people who purify ourselves, a people who want to live holy lives, a people who are, who are determined by your grace and by your power to live lives of purity and holiness so that we will not be ashamed at his coming. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Let's stand together and sing.